Good afternoon. I am Samantha McComb. I am the librarian of the Linen Hall, and I am delighted to welcome you to this afternoon's lecture. So I first heard of the James Mitchell letter before I came to the Linen Hall at a lecture given by the late and much missed Dr. Eamon Phoenix. And I was delighted when I came to the library to discover it was from our archive. I know Dr. Phoenix was a mentor and friend to today's speaker, Jason Burke, and I'm sure he would be as pleased as I am that Jason is continuing to shine a light on this important piece of history, which it is our privilege to preserve and make accessible. Jason Burke is a historian and proud native of East Belfast. He holds an MA in history from Queen's University Belfast. He is a dedicated researcher and content creator Jason is committed to making history accessible and engaging for all. He is the host of the critically acclaimed historical Belfast podcast, described in one review as a Belfast TARDIS, transporting listeners through time to explore the city's rich history. He is renowned for his guest talks, and after today you will know why, and he occasionally writes columns for the Belfast Telegraph, and leads historical walking tours of Belfast City Cemetery. <coughs> Jason is also a former colleague and a great friend to the Linen Hall, and during his time with us, he gave real insight into the rare and unique collections and archives at the library, and I am particularly pleased he is here with us today to do just that. So please join me in welcoming Jason Burke. It sounds like I have a lot to live up to after that introduction. Thank you very much. First of all, can I thank uh, Patsy, Samantha, and Julie from the Linden Hall Library for the invitation to speak here today. I, amongst other things, uh, used to work in Patsy's role, and I introduced many great speakers onto this stage. Uh, but this is the first opportunity I've ever had to speak at the Linden Hall in my own right. So. Um, it's really, really exciting and nerve-wracking, as he said, uh, to be back here. So thank you for the opportunity. But by way of some uh, context, uh, they are uh, to set the scene. Uh, Irish separatism during the 1914-1916 period became energised at the expense of a floundering constitutional nationalism, which had clung on to a British war effort that was dragging them to their demise. And despite often being treated in isolation, the First World War made rebellion possible in Ireland, providing England's difficulty and Ireland's opportunity. Republican activity reached a crescendo on Easter Monday, 1916, when a rebellion hatched by the shady Irish Republican Brotherhood, the IRB, exploded onto the streets of Dublin with devastating consequences. Some 1,200 rebels from various organizations led an occupation of the buildings across the city, triggering a battle with the British army for control of the Irish capital. Almost 500 people lost their lives, many of whom were civilians during the six-day struggle for Dublin. Now, my avenue into this topic was through the First World War. And while back doing my master's at Queen's, Several of my sort of long form essays dealt with the, the rising. My dissertation itself, although being on the First World War, was supervised by Professor uh, Fergal McGarry, who in many ways is an authoritative voice uh, on the Eastern Rising. However, it was during that research, and indeed since then, in, in writing it all up for what I hope will become a, a book someday, that it became clear to me uh, that the rebellion in Dublin had consequences for Belfast uh, and East Belfast more specifically. Individuals from the East found themselves on both sides of this chaotic episode. Some of them were injured and some of them, as we will hear in the course of this talk, lost their lives during the course of Easter week in 1916. But one story in particular uh, caught my eye during the course of this research. It's a sensational eyewitness account of the rising which came to light about 20 years ago, after laying untouched 
and forgotten for over half a century in a disused bank vault on Belfast's York Street. My understanding is then it was brought to the attention of the aforementioned late great Dr. Eamon Phoenix, who then deposited to the archives here at the Linden Hall Library. This 49 page document it turns out to be written in longhand on Gresham Hotel head of note paper describes the thrilling experiences of a James Mitchell, 38 year old primary school teacher from the Mount uh, in inner East Belfast. Not only was he from East Belfast, but we can say with some certainty that he was a unionist, having signed the Ulster Covenant in September 1912 at Belfast City Hall. It's also entirely possible, and there was speculation from Ian Phoenix himself, that James Mitchell might have been involved in the Ulster Volunteer Force in East Belfast, formed in 1913. However, UVF's nominal rules, which I've been through forensically, they're held at Prony, they're recorded in code. And so it's impossible to say for sure who was and who wasn't involved uh, in their ranks. So unless anyone out there can help me crack a code, uh, we can't say for certain whether James Mitchell was involved with the East Belfast UVF. Nevertheless, Jim, as we will refer to him, along with his younger brother Joe, travelled to Dublin on Easter Saturday 1916 with the objective of enlisting with the British Army. It's not clear to me why he chose this route as opposed to enlisting at one of the stations or recruiting offices in Belfast, for example, at the Old Town Hall in Victoria Street. Nevertheless, once they arrived in the Irish capital, they decided they were going to take in a performance by the Wilkie Bard at the Theatre Royal before socialising in the officers' mess at Portobello Barracks until about three in the morning. The next day then, 10.30 a.m., Jim was put through his necessary military tests and he declared early on in his set of letters, result, I've become a soldier of the king on Easter Sunday. Easter Monday, 1916, was of course the day that the rising eventually began after much confusion caused by a botched gun running attempt um, and then countermanding orders by Owen McNeil, which forbade the Irish volunteers to rise as had been planned. But unawares, uh, East Belfast man John Clark McDermott and his friend Robert Orchard um, had arranged to spend a holiday in Dublin uh, for a sightseeing visit on Easter Monday. And these things, as you can see from the image behind me, were being advertised in the local uh, newspapers at the time. Orchard had previously enlisted for military service, while McDermott would go on to do so, achieving a military cross and reaching the rank of lieutenant while serving with the machine gun corps. But armed with a street map of the Hibernian metropolis, they first made their way to Nelson's Pillar, then past Trinity College, onto the fashionable shopping area of Grafton Street. And they quoted, uh, or they remembered later, people seemed very much in holiday mood recalled McDermott, apart from the fact that here and there we noticed several small bodies of men clad in green uniform who appeared to be on patrol. They did not seem to attract either surprise or attention and we put them down to some southern way of celebrate, celebrating Easter. From Grafton Street then the two men headed for St Patrick's Cathedral which was packed with interested visitors, some of which they had identified were from Belfast. And from the cathedral then, they wandered down Dean Street, stopping for lunch at the Dublin Bread Company's bustling restaurant off Sackville Street, we know today as O'Connell Street. In the course of our lunch, we heard shooting outside and an explosion, remembered McDermott. We realised by this time that something highly abnormal was taking place. The two men paid their bill and said goodbye and the Dublin Bread Company restaurant was destroyed shortly after during the fighting. And something highly abnormal was indeed taking place. Irish rebels had seized control of seemingly insignificant buildings in the centre of Dublin, including a bakery, a biscuit factory and a hospital for the poor. At 12.45pm outside the General Post Office on Sackville Street, Patrick Pearce proclaimed an Irish Republic. And it was the beginning then of a violent rebellion that will last 
for about five days and result in the deaths of almost 500 people. Meanwhile, our East Belfast brothers, James and Joe Mitchell, had joined the middle class exodus from the capital to the ferry house races. And while there, they heard rumours of, quote, trouble with Sinn Féiners in the city. Mitchell decided to make his way back then to the safe confines of the Gresham Hotel, where he encountered, quote, Cecil McConnell sitting disconsolately in the lounge, and he informed me that he had been motoring from Waterford. On reaching King's Bridge, a group of soldiers told him that there was trouble ahead, but he went on in the Rover car. When passing St Stephen's Green, he was stopped by a cordon of Sinn Féiners in uniform and with rifles. They took the motor car, examined all his correspondence, but he was allowed to hand over his suitcase to a doctor living in the Green. He then footed it to the Gresham, and no word since of the car has reached home. More on the fate of this car later becomes important in the story. <coughs> it wasn't until that evening, on Easter Monday, that James Mitchell realised the seriousness of the situation outside. He wrote in his notepaper, I went out alone on Monday night and saw some ghastly sights. Two horses lay dead, their soldier riders having been shot dead and carried into the hotel. Human blood covered the footway. The soldiers he referred to were members of a company of lancers that had been fired on by insurgents. As the situation deteriorated, a 1,000 strong Ulster Composite Battalion, as they became known as, was immediately readied and sent to Dublin. This battalion was drawn from the Ulster based reserves of the Enniskillen Fusiliers, the Royal Irish Rifles, and the Royal Irish Fusiliers. They've been described elsewhere as a quote, predominantly Ulster Unionist composition drawn from various reserve battalions of the 36th Ulster Division. And then by extension, some of them, most of them, will have been members of the Ulster Volunteer Force during the Home Rule Crisis. But as the historian Neil Richardson has admitted, the reality of the situation was much more complex than simply this body of Ulster Unionists travelling south, as we will hear when we get into the talk. But as the Ulster Composite Battalion were en route to Dublin by train, some Ulster reservists were already in Dublin and in the vicinity of the rebellion. Second Lieutenant Thomas Boston of number 76, The Mount, ironically, the same street which James Mitchell was from, um, was at that time in charge of a detachment of the 12th in the Skilling and Fusiliers, undergoing instruction at the musketry school in Dollymount. Boston was later mentioned in dispatches for his role in the suppression of the rebellion, and he was one of several East Belfast servicemen who served with various units in Dublin during the Rising. James Mitchell then noted that, quote, all police and military were confined to barracks, and the mob, as he described them, had complete possession of the principal thoroughfares. He also witnessed large-scale looting in Sackville Street. Eileen Costello was a member of the Gaelic League. Uh, she was also staying in the Gresham Hotel over Easter weekend as part of a, ga a gathering of Irish uh, colleges who were at a conference. She described uh, how she saw on Easter Monday, quote, people from the slums breaking and looting a shop. It was Lawrence's toy shop. I saw the looters inside the shop throwing out toys and cameras to their friends outside. I felt very great disgust. Later on, I saw people in the Gresham Hotel with jewellery that they had bought from the looters. I saw a woman with a ring and another with a brooch. That night, uh, an eerie silence descended on the city centre of Dublin, where, quote, every building was barricaded and loopholed by the Sinn Féiners, but all was peaceful within, said Jim Mitchell. But seemingly life continued more or less normally in the hotel, with dining rooms and bars kept busy with what he described as nerve-shattered guests. Eileen Costello then remembered that by Easter Tuesday, there was a quote, shortage of food in the Gresham Hotel. The doors were closed. No more guests were admitted. Waiters had to go out at night to collect bread, potatoes, vegetables, and milk. Elsewhere, 
is John Clark McDermott and his friend Robert Orchard tried to make their escape back to Belfast. The Ulster Composite Battalion were heading in the opposite direction by train to Amiens Street Station, meaning what today is Conway Station. As they made the approach to Dublin, they were informed of concerns about rebel activity along the railway line, and so they decided to disembark at Clontarf. And then, just as McDermott and Orchard had done earlier in the day, the Ulster Composite Battalion marched through Fairway on their way to Dublin city centre. One unit of the Ulster Composite Battalion was already in Dublin when the Rising began, the 3rd Royal Irish Rifles, a battalion which consisted mostly of Ulster men but had a smattering of uh, southern uh, soldiers within its ranks. They were stationed at Portobello Barracks. From the opening stages of the rebellion, the 3rd Royal Irish Rifles operated in the vicinity of Jacob's factory, which had been occupied by the 2nd Battalion of the Irish Volunteers, the rebels. At Jacob's factory, the rebel garrison were able to inflict casualties on the British army by firing from the factory roof into the grounds of Dublin Castle and even into Portobello Barracks itself. Serving with the 3rd Royal Irish Rifles was Captain John Charles McLuggan of 68 Belmont Avenue in East Belfast, who received a bayonet wound to the hand during fighting at Jacob's Pistol <coughs> Factory. You might say that this East Belfast man quite literally had a hand in the Easter Rising, having been wounded in the hand by a bayonet. McLuggan had been a prominent member of the Ulster Volunteer Force, acting as secretary and company commander of the 6th Strandtown Battalion of the East Belfast Regiment. Uh, in later years, he recalled some of his UVF activities during the whole road crisis, and he said, I remember being called to Lord Peary's home at Ormiston. Lord Peary was the managing director of the shipyard, of course, to take a consignment of guns. And some more were sent to my home to be collected by a group of men who each arrived in a large overcoat and equipped with a lace. The lace was for tying the rifle around the neck of its carrier, he said McCluggan. And when the war broke out and the 36th Ulster Division was formed, McLuggan obtained a commission in the 8th Royal Irish Rifles, Bally McCart's own, and was subsequently then the proud recipient of a service sword from members of his UVF company. So here's a, a well decorated UVF man in Dublin uh, involved in the suppression of the rising. It brings a civil war element to what's going on in Dublin that we don't often consider. Wednesday the 26th then began in thunderous fashion when HMS Helga opened fire on James Connolly's headquarters at Liberty Hall from St George's Quay at about 8 a.m. James Mitchell was awakened by what he described as terrific rattling and roaring nearby. But amongst the chaos, he still found some time for humour. A boat of some kind is at O'Connell Bridge, wrote Mitchell, and is evidently the cause of the loud reverberations. What these mean, I know not, as I know, as no result is, as I said, apparent. What I do know is that I got a damn fine reception into the army and I saluted the guns as they're approachable. We dressed and had a look out at Sackville Street. Three men were lying dead on the roadway near to the Parnell statue. All the windows and doors of the hotel are now barricaded and we are practically prisoners in this building. A jolly good crowd we are, though headed by the leading lights of the Doily Cart Opera Company. Poor Billington is fed up with this whole business and he wishes he was out of this hellish country. The Wednesday of Easter week turned out to be the costliest day of the rising so far for the British military as the fighting intensified. It witnessed one of the most infamous events of the week at the junction of Haddington Road and Northumberland Street. During the Battle of Mount Street Bridge, as it came to be known, 17 Republicans took on two entire battalions of the Sherwood Foresters, about 1,700 men, as they made their way into the city from Kingstown. The rebels inflicted about 160 casualties, including 26 fatalities on the Sherwood Foresters, mm -hmm. while suffering just four fatalities of their own. And naturally, some of, the, some of the rebels were in high spirits. Robert Holland, who was a member of the Fianna Erin in Dublin, recalled how he thought that they had, quote, eliminated all the troops that landed at Kingstown, and we are only mopping up the crowd that were coming down from Belfast. All this is what we were told by the odd stragglers that came in, and we readily believed it all. Yet, as Mitchell records, 
The rebel headquarters remained intact. He said the GPO by this stage was still solidly square and flying on the top of the portico was the flag of the Irish Republic. Thursday the 27th then was the day that the British made their decisive move, having finally assembled a force that could bring the rebellion to an end. At 9am, following a, a breakfast of booty beef and biscuits, the Ulster Composite Battalion were given their orders for the day ahead. They were to remove insurgents from Lower Gardner Street near to their Amiens Street Station headquarters. Among them was 2nd Lieutenant William Moore of the Albert Bridge Road, and he spelled fast. Moore was educated at Campbell College and Queen's University before obtaining a commission in the 10th Royal Irish Fusiliers in January 1916. The Belfast newsletter reported that Moore quote, took part in the suppression of the Sinn Féin rebellion in Dublin. Moore was later killed in action on the 16th of August 1917 on the Western Front during the Battle of Langemark. He was just 24 years old. And over the course of that day, the Ulster Composite Battalion sustained more casualties and more fatalities, some of which were even accidental and caused by friendly fire. Second Lieutenant Charles Crockett from Londonderry, for example, was killed by a British Army sentry near Portland Road. Back at the Gresham Hotel, Jim received a phone call from a British officer reporting serious fighting uh, at Portobello Barracks. He said, when I wrote last night regarding the invasion of Portobello Barracks by the Sinn Feiners, I was certain that no attack would be attempted there. I was deluded. We've just had word from Morgan that the position there is serious as the Sinn Feiners are on all sides and the bullets are whistling past as he was speaking to me. After dinner, all were to clear out of the front rooms as the military intended to clear Sackville Street of all snipers and to bombard the GPO. Blinds were drawn, shutters were put up, and while at a game of solo, there was a terrific roar. British shells then had struck the YMCA building and the Catholic club, as it was described, while sniper rounds had hit the blind institution. Jim then said, we then saw a plucky action the door of the blind institution opened, a man emerged with a Union Jack wrapped around him, and at the same moment a similar flag was flung across one of the windows. As the shots had come from a field 18 pounder placed in a street just above our hotel, the man rushed across towards it and apparently had a consultation with the gunners. Uh, he shortly returned to the building uh, and it suffered no more. What a sight the YMCA presented similar to a scene in one of the shell towns in France. As we were taking dinner, an armoured car passed slowly down Sackville Street. An officer left it, and on entering the hotel informed us that we all must leave the front rooms and to take to the back rooms and the basement as the GPO was about to be shelled from the street opposite our building. On Friday, the 28th, Major General Sir John Maxwell arrived in Dublin at 2 a.m. as military governor of Ireland, declaring that only an unconditional surrender by the rebels would be acceptable to him. It was a day when the British tightened their cordon around the locations such as the General Post Office and the South Dublin Union. Elsewhere, though, 15 civilians mistaken for Republicans were killed by the South Staffordshire Regiment in what became known as the North King Street Massacre. They were among 42 civilians killed on that day alone. Of the eight British forces that were killed on Friday the 28th, one was from East Belfast, killed with the Ulster Composite Battalion, Rifleman Edward John Hanna, a Catholic lad from 63 Anderson Street in the Short Strand District. He had enlisted with the 4th Lord Irish Rifles, who were a reserve battalion. <clears throat> Politically, the Hanna family uh, contained a mixture of staunch supporters for Joe Devlin and the Irish Parliamentary Party, as well as some early supporters of the Sinn Féin movement. Nonetheless, when some of his battalion were sent to Dublin as part of the Ulster Composite Battalion, Edward John Hanna was among them. The grandchildren of Edward John Hanna have recounted how their grandfather, quote, joined the army on the call of John Redmond, the home rule activist, served in Europe and was home on leave in Belfast when the Easter Rising started. 
and was recalled to the army and taken by lorry to Dublin. Now, whether that matches up with what actually happened, I'm quite sure it was not far off. Consequently, though, Hannah was killed in action during the rebellion on the 28th of April 1916. He's buried in Greenwich Gorman Military Cemetery. An in memoriam notice that I found a couple of years later in the Belfast Evening Telegraph of 1918 read, we, th we little thought when he left home that he would never return, that he so soon in death would sleep and leave us here to mourn. Sleep on, dear daddy, and take your rest. I miss you most, who loved you best, on whose sweet soul, on whose soul, sweet Jesus, have mercy. Fondly remembered by his loving wife and little daughter, Mary Ann and Eliza Jane, 63 Anderson Street in Short Strand, East Belfast. Rifleman Edward John Hanna remains the only known individual from the Short Strand to have participated in the Easter Rising on either side. The fact that he did so in a British Army uniform means that his story is virtually unknown. In an Irish news article in 2016, Claire Hanna, MP, uh, who's a descendant of Edward John Hanna, spoke openly about another of her relatives, Dennis Hanna, of 62 Anderson Street in the Short Strand, <coughs> who appeared in the iconic photograph of Unionist leaders signing the Ulster Covenant in September 1912. That's him circled on the end there. And why would he, why would a young Catholic lad from the Short Strand be in that photograph, one of the most iconic photographs in Irish history, well, when you look at his uh, census entry for 1911, he's a telegram boy. And so whenever telegrams were arriving at Belfast City Hall from around and across the empire to be delivered to Edward Carson and Craig and the leaders of unionism, there was this young Catholic lad, he was about 14 or 15 years old at the time, delivering them uh, from 62 Anderson Street in the Short Strand. However, Dennis Hanna also then enlisted in the Royal Irish Rifles. He unfortunately was killed in August 1916 on the Western Front. And this discovery in Clara Hanna's family history was described as a revelation for her. She had previously assumed that Dennis had somehow died in the 1940s. And to quote her, she said, I can only surmise that having a dead British soldier in my family and my father's family was a source of embarrassment or tension, and thus the fate of Dennis Hanna had been excised from the intimate family history. Dennis and Edward John Hanna were cousins. Uh, they lived at, as I said, 62, 63 Anderson Street, respectively, yet Edward's story was not mentioned, nor was his name even mentioned in the Irish News article. I tried to reach out to Claire Hanna about him. She never came back to me. So presumably, uh, having Edward's story in the family history is also uh, a source of embarrassment. As the British tightened their grip that Friday, we begin to see the revealing of Jim Mitchell's personal opinions on the rebellion for the first time. And he said, We have now come to look upon all these happenings in a matter-of-fact way. The abnormal has become normal. I reflect after seeing the dead men and horses in the street that anything must happen and should happen to save the state. The individual as such becomes worthless and negligible if he is antipathetic to the well-being of the community. One becomes convinced by the necessity of one for all and all for the state. Any man who passively or actively denies this truth becomes as the rat vermin and should be destroyed as such. I felt relief and secretly exulted at the inglorious end of such creatures with such mean and selfish minds. With such satisfying and soothing thoughts, I fell asleep. But he also provides more insight into the goings on in the hotel itself. Thinking it over, the women are a long way ahead of the men in behaviour. One could scarcely believe that such craven fear existed in the minds of those who call themselves men. This fear has proved extremely useful, as it has afforded the almost entire comedy of our imprisonment. We take delight in the signs of terror in their faces. 
uh, of some of the mere meals and allow no opportunity to evoke them to pass. We rattle chairs in the darkness, drop tin boxes, bang tables for the pleasure of seeing some of them scuttle away to the safety of an improvised dugout or the security of a room far from the roof. A few seek courage in quaffing innumerably strong liquors uh, and the result is almost nervous. <coughs> By Saturday, the rebellion was heading towards a conclusion. The rebels' GPO contingent made their chaotic retreat to a building on Moore Street where they remained under pressure from the 18th Royal Irish Rifles who contained many Belfast men. One of the rebels, uh, James Cavanagh, recalled seeing, quote, an old man come out of a shop on the opposite side of the street. No sooner did he appear than a bullet from one of the 18th Royal Irish who were manning a barricade at the end of the street struck him and he fell to the ground. The 18th Royal Irish, a regiment of Irishmen in the British Army, had shot at anything that moved in the street. And at such short range, their shooting was deadly, he said. That day, the 18th Royal Irish Rifles lost rifleman Nathaniel Morton, a 19-year-old lad from the Shankill, who died of wounds. Also with the 18th Royal Irish Rifles was Lieutenant William Dixon McKee of Cypress Park in East Belfast. McKee had recently returned from Argentina, of all places, uh, to join the army. McKee's name was brought to the attention of the Secretary of State for War, Lord Kitchener, for distinguished services rendered in connection with the Dublin Rebellion, though he was eventually killed in action on the Western Front in August 1917. The rebels didn't hold out long in Moor Street. At 12.45 p.m. on Saturday the 29th, a white flag was sent out to a British barricade to discuss terms. The British Operational Commander, Brigadier General William Lowe, made it clear that he would only accept an unconditional surrender. And at 3.30 p.m., Patrick Pierce was received by Lowe to surrender in person. And Jim Mitchell bore witness to it all. That evening at early dinner time, we witnessed the surrender of about 500 Sinn Féin troops who delivered up their arms to the military almost opposite our hotel, he said. This looked to be the beginning of the end. While at dinner, the sergeant placed the three riflemen in charge of our hotel and amored that if we looked out of the windows, we would see, quote, the mournful procession of prisoners marching the street. His statement was not strictly accurate, as in a few moments, a long procession of men, fully armed, passed by in single file. That was the first action of a large number of Sinn Féiners who were headed by one in green uniform and a slouch hat holding up a white flag. They were advancing to the commander of the military in Sackville Street to throw down their arms as a token of surrender. This was more intensely interesting than a mere procession of prisoners. Joe and I climbed to the roof and taking the risk of getting landed by a sniper, as often before, we had a capital view of all the past below. We also had the selfish satisfaction of having this point of bandage to ourselves. All the materials thrown on the ground were afterwards collected by the troops in the semi-darkness and taken away to be stored, as we heard, in the custom house vaults. Some of the soldiers, however, sold revolvers rifles and a quantity of cartridges, field glasses and small ammunition to civilians before very long. Before the prisoners were marched off, the Sinn Féiners were formed up two deep in their name for taking down in notebooks. Two plainclothes policemen accompanied the officers and one man was picked out and placed between two soldiers with drawn bayonets. We heard that this individual had been a deserter from the army who had joined the rebels in the post office. Soon all were marched off, uh, the procession turning round into Great Britain Street. Needless to say, Great Britain Street isn't known as Great Britain Street anymore. <coughs> Although the headquarters and the four courts had now surrendered, the rebels remained in place at the College of Surgeons, Jacobs Factory, Bowman's Mill, the South Dublin Union, and in Fingal. It wasn't until Sunday that the news of the surrender then filtered through to the the remaining uh, rebel strongpoints. 
Meanwhile, John Clark McDermott and his friend Robert Orchard, do you remember them? They discovered that a train service was running between Drogheda and Belfast, so they took the decision to walk the 30 miles uh, from Clontarf to Drogheda. They began the long trek after breakfast on the Saturday morning. When they reached Drogheda, they successfully boarded the Belfast train and settled into an empty carriage. They eventually reached Belfast in the early hours of Sunday morning, almost a week after they had left for a day trip. <coughs> Despite the surrender and the conclusion of the rebellion, the death and suffering continued in the days that followed. Rifleman James McCulloch of Constant Street in East Belfast had initially joined the 8th Royal Irish Rifles but was attached to the 17th Battalion. On the 2nd of May 1916, McCulloch died at King George's Hospital in Dublin, aged 54, from a gunshot wound which he had received during the rebellion. McCulloch was the last man to die in Dublin while serving with the Ulster Composite Battalion. He left behind a wife and family, two of which were serving on the Western Front with the British Army. McCulloch was buried in Grange Gorman Military Cemetery along with Edward John Hannah. By Monday morning then, a week after the outbreak, Jim Mitchell rose to find the streets crowded with sightseers and patrolled by lancers. Walking towards St Stephen's Green, he was astounded by the scenes of devastation which greeted him and, quote, the trenches which had been dug out by the Sinn Feiners in St Stephen's Green itself. We then visited the Shelburne Hotel, which also bore many traces of the visitation of bullets. While there, we met Sir Robert Anderson of Belfast, who informed Cecil McConnell that the latter's car was safely housed in the Irish Automobile Club's garage. Cecil lost no time in getting there, and we found the car with little damage shown. The rugs and the cushions were missing, and the tyres were deflated, having been punctured by bayonets. Only one mark showing on each tyre, and little trouble was necessary to make the car fit enough to do the journey. Meanwhile, back at the Gresham Hotel, a few loving-minded individuals, as Jim Mitchell describes them, are actually asking the hotel manager of all people in the world when the cattle which they had brought over for the spring show will be able to be moved from Ballsbridge to England and Scotland. As a pleasing contrast to this, one cheerily optimistic lady wants to know if the dance which was previously arranged for Wednesday next will come off and how those who had already bought tickets will be able to reach and depart from the Aberdeen Hall. Doyle, who's the hotel manager, soothes and delights the dear soul by informing her that he has already made arrangements for innumerable taxis to be specially commandeered and convey the distinguished parties wishing to trip the light fantastic and that the military will form guards of honour throughout the thoroughfares of Dublin adjacent to the hotel. Jim said, conceive of it, dancing with the scenes of horror and destruction all around us. What minds must some people possess? Jim spent his Tuesday and Wednesday trying to obtain a leave pass so that he could get home to Belfast before his inevitable deployment to the Western Front. His colonel, upon learning of the week that Jim had experienced, granted him a generous leave until the following Tuesday. What a glorious effect this news had on Alex and myself. The prospect of seeing our people again and of obtaining clean, fresh clothes again and, of course, money was exhilarating. In a marvellously short period, we were out of the hotel and in a car, rushing to catch the 5pm train north. <coughs> Unfortunately, the vehicle had to travel via a torturous route, and we had the chagrin of finding that our train had just gone back to square one for Jim. He then walked it to the Irish Automobile Club garage with the intention of retrieving his friend McConnell's car, which had been seized by the rebels the previous week. The car, it seemed, Still wouldn't be fit to drive, though, until the next day, the Thursday, which meant another night stuck in the Gresham Hotel for Jim. <coughs> At 1pm on the Thursday, then, Jim was finally in the patched-up car and on his way back north, sweeping back into Belfast at about 5.20pm. At home in Belfast, concluded Jim in his letter, all our experiences seem now to be those of a dream. 
Everything that has passed within the past 12 days has the impression of unreality. And I suppose it will be days before the events uh, and incidents attain their true perspective. Jim handed the car back to its original owner with the vehicle's cushions, which had been discovered in a rebel trench in St. Stephen's Green. There is a plate to be placed on the cushions, which will commemorate an occasion which will remain memorable during the whole lives of at least four Belfast men, wrote Jim. Cecil McConnell, Joe Mitchell, and Rifleman Alex Gannell. And now to bed and sweet repose. And he finally put his head down at number 121, the mount in East Belfast. And I mentioned at the beginning that this handwritten account had lay untouched for over uh, 50 years and possibly more. And the temptation would be to believe that Jim went on then to the Western Front and maybe perished, and that's why uh, the set of letters hadn't been collected from the bank vault. However, we know that Jim became a lieutenant with the Royal Army Service Corps and served in Mesopotamia from October 1917. Ultimately, he received three medals for his military service in the First World War. His military service record awaits my consultation at the National Archives in London, and this will give us a better insight into his experiences of the First World War. But according to the Belfast Street Directory, in 1920, Jim was recorded as still living at 121 the Mount in East Belfast. So we know that he survived the war. Not only did he survive the war, but he lived on to the ripe old age of 88, and he died in 1963 and was buried in Belfast City Cemetery. His last place of address was recorded as the Malone Road in the leafy suburbs. And so it sounds like Jim did okay in the end. Thank you very much. That segment that I gave on the prisoners was, was, was all he mentioned about it. Now, what, what we do have, obviously, is the Bureau of Military History, uh, witness statements, that lady Eileen Costello, who I mentioned, uh, I, I included a couple of bits there, but it wasn't totally relevant to the talk today. She also spends that week in the Gresham Hotel and gives, in some ways, a very different version of events. She's coming from a very nationalist background. She talks about <laughs> disputes and fallouts that happen within the Gresham Hotel. She talks about a, a, a whip round going round to raise money for a couple of snipers who are on the roof of the Gresham Hotel. She confronts them and says, I absolutely won't put putting my name to this. But she talks about seeing different things than what Jim, Jim Mitchell has seen. So it might be worth consulting the Bureau of Military History witness statements to see if anybody else in that area is shedding any light on that incident. Thank you. Anything else? Any more questions? Yeah, I'm just going I, I presume Jason was those kind of first hand. I mean, it's fantastic to have a first hand account like that. Are there many first hand accounts of, I suppose, from Northern, from Northerners of the Rising? Yeah, well, that's an important distinction there at the end. Yeah. Well, what, what one first person, uh, or the answer to the first person, yes, there absolutely is. Yeah. Um, and that's why I was surprised last year when I was invited to put this together for a talk for the Dublin Festival of History. Um, and they build it as, you know, you thought you'd heard everything about the rising, but you saw here's something else. Yeah. So there are quite a lot of eyewitness accounts, quite a lot of first-hand eyewitness accounts. And a great place to start with this is the local press at the time. So I was speaking in Cooktown recently. They had a newspaper there, the Middles, Middlestar Mail, I think it was. And it seemed that there were quite a lot of teachers, possibly at the same conference that Eileen Costello was at in the Gresham Hotel. Quite a lot of school teachers from the Cookstown area had been uh, in Dublin when the rising broke out, and they came back and immediately then they're giving interviews to the local press. So reading the likes of the Belfast Telegraph and some of the uh, 
so that it will lose papers at the time. You find these amazing eyewitness accounts that you wouldn't necessarily get anywhere else. And of course, the Bureau of Military History Witness Statements, which you can search for free online by keyword search. And um, you know, over the last week, just by trying to add to this talk, I just searched Gresham. And you have so many people involved in the Gresham Hotel. Not as many involved in Easter Week, uh, but the Gresham then has a, a remarkable story there from about 1920 onwards. Michael Collins uh, using it for various things. And that picture, which I used at the very start, actually is, is, is from the War of Independence uh, period. So, yeah, there's, there's quite a lot out there to sift through. And that's why I tried to give this one a particularly spell fast slant because I don't think it's, it's been done before, but also it puts it in a nice context for Jim. Who, uh, who's from Belfast? I don't know if I missed this last couple of people just to sort something But how many, how long is, does that, how, how many words are there, for example, in that account? Does it very sustained? Um, I did transcribe it all, and I can't remember off the top of my head, but it's, it's 49 pages long, where the yeah. pages are what, A5, about half of it, not the last, the yeah. bad size. 49 of those. I've transcribed them all into a Word document, which I'm happy to share with them. It may have been transcribed before elsewhere. Yes. But it is substantial, so I picked out just some of the highlights. Nice. But yeah, there's quite a lot of detail. Uh, quite a lot of detail. Wow. Um, and as mentioned before, the David Phoenix had been doing talks um, about Jim Mitchell. And he had been speaking during the decade of centenaries about trying to turn the Mitchell letters into a book, which unfortunately uh, never materialised then. Um, so I don't know how much of Eamon's research is still sitting there somewhere ready to be ready to be worked on. I will worry about my phone. You are there? Yes. yes. I just need to see the question on cell phone now. Not that I'm aware of. I did the tail end of last year. I visited the Gresham, and with with the idea of going back to the Gresham and trying to retrace Jim's footsteps in terms of some of the rooms that he would have been because from the letters we were able to pinpoint where he was at various moments and i wanted to go there and make a podcast along with Donald fallon of the three castles burning podcast and try and retrace jim's steps but to cut a long story short i went into the gresham hotel presented myself to the reception um, and the person couldn't have been any less interested <laughs> to say the least they took all my details in fact it was broken english they didn't really speak english as the first language I had real difficulty trying to explain. My name's Jason. I'm from Belfast. There's this wee set of letters in the Little Hall Library. It mentions the Gresham Hotel. It's on your head of notepaper. Could I please come back and do some recording here? Left on the detail, I never heard anything else. So I don't know what the hotel have. I'd love to, to, to make a contact with somebody there uh, to hear and see what they have, but they didn't seem to have much interest. Uh, Mike? And of course, it's quite famous from the Luke Sunday as well. Yeah. Uh, room 14, Yeah, there's there's a tremendous history with the hotel, and maybe they're just maybe not quite willing to engage with some of it for whatever reason. I don't know, but they they, they certainly never responded to. Okay. Any more any more questions? Yeah. And uh, yeah, even though the Lord Chief Justice, yeah, I think yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. He, um, about 10 years ago, I was taking some tours around Campbell College. There's a connection to Campbell College. The McDermott, McDermott brothers went to Campbell College. And I think, sorry, was it, was it his son that went on to be Lord Chief Justice? Um, but his son, a very old man who was like maybe in his 90s or something, then was on the on the tour that I was given at Campbell College, and I, I didn't know, he didn't tell me until after, and I've been talking about uh, John Clark McDermott, and also there's a, a, a McDermott lad who was in the 36th Ulster Division, he was the first officer killed, uh, Robert uh, McDermott, so yeah, tremendously interesting family, um, and that account was taken from a, a book, which is, a, which is in the archives here, of McDermott's uh, memoirs, I think it's called a, An Interesting and Honourable Life or, or something like that, but yeah, a great account of the Easter Rising from an East Belfast perspective in that. Uh, I think we will we'll just like uh, it's nearly time here. Unless it's one last question, I'll take one last. Otherwise, Jason is here, and I'm sure he'd be happy to chat to anyone, you know, at the end. But uh, just to say thank you so thank much, you. Jason. A fantastic hour for all of us mm -hmm. in the audience listening to that brilliant story. So thank you, Jason. Thank you.